I promise you, I will not bore you, hopefully. Um, but I try to get you a little bit the flair of this week, hopefully. You should have fun. And hopefully you will also figure out that that what you're doing here, if basic or applied, it's pretty much one line and where you end up in your career, you really don't know. So you see here on my, my entrance slide two pictures, one which is Alba now and the second one which will be Alba in the future. And so I, I thought long if I should show that, but I think it is really what is the spirit at the moment, what you see in this facility. It's a lot of new things, a lot of drive, and it's all motivated by really making a, a clear impact on that what is needed outside. So the facility itself is a big, gigantic, uh, facility with a lot of operation. You see we have 2,200 yearly users, so many people are benefiting. We have about, in the meanwhile, I think 235 uh, staff members. Uh, we have 10 operating beam lines at the same time. And we uh, build at the moment four beam lines uh, in construction. So here is the kind of setup what you see. Um, when you go on the floor, you will hear about the ins different instruments a lot uh, during the talks. I think you will have enough uh, 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 chances to get on the floor and really speak with people. Uh, one thing what you should uh, have in mind, if you do anything with Alba, we are, uh, now I have, here. So this is an intelligence test, this uh, pointer. So we have three sections, so life science, uh, chemical and material science section, and the electronic and magnetic structure section. So that's the people who directly deal with the user community. And you see that the different kind of here, uh, beam lines are correlated with this three section, and this three section are running these 10 instruments. So here a little bit more in a, in a verbal form, you see that this are the three sections, what I said before. Each section has between five and three beam lines. And then there is here a new section, what we just create. And that takes care about that this individual instruments can be used together. The other thing what they are doing is here optics and they have a, a industrial beam line directly. And so much to what innovation on a synchrotron may be. And then we have obviously also a support section. So, but that tells you already that normally in a synchrotron, traditionally it's one instrument, one experiment, but to get to this kind of level where we have really impact, we have to do much more. So here a little bit to the way how we are running. You see there are always something like four to six weeks where we run through. It's uh, 624, and then there are some shutdowns of one week, and there are two big shutdowns uh, between uh, uh, Christmas and summer. And then you see the facility is really reliable. Most of the time when you should have a beam, you really have beam. So that makes really a facility productive. Now to the industrial program. So um, nearly everywhere in the world you see the same picture. So that the pharmaceutical industry is the dominating user of the facilities. There is chemical industry and catalysis, nanotechnology and polymers, and then a bunch of other industrial sectors. However, if you look now in the beam time uh, of the different beam lines, uh, natural for pharmaceutical, the MX beam line is dominating, and then you can distribute it to all the rest. Now, if you look on the last year, there's something really interesting happening. So you see that nanotechnology and pharmaceutical technology starts to, to get equal. So that may be a singularity. Uh, I think uh, Alejandro can say more to that. Or that is really some indication because there's a huge need at the moment. So 
when we speak about innovation, innovation is a really funny term. If you ask 10 people, they will answer 10 different answers. Okay? So, but one part of innovation is something like that. So this is an industrial beamline which builds some uh, optics for the ESA where an industry builds a telescope. And they are assembling simple C, C instrument. And they do metrology there. So this is a kind of uh, way how a synchrotron can contribute. So here you see also another way how innovation works. So a synchrotron has a lot of kind of needs of technolo technologies. And so obviously these are opportunities of the local industry to develop new products and new product lines. And this is exactly some kind of ways how we are involved in this process. Now, Let's go to really science. And so, as a synchrotron person, I put ourselves in the center, as usual. And then you have the user community for which we are really doing everything. But to do this kind of really complex stuff, you need a lot of collaboration, sorry, uh, and that's the collaborators. So people with expertise and with additional resources. So here is an example where CISIC, so the Spanish uh, uh, funding facility, is investing in ALBA to build a battery lab and staffing the battery lab so that in future people can use much easier their materials, assemble here the battery, and then measure directly the operando uh, experiments and obviously also at one point do the aging. So, another example for this kind of collaboration with the research infrastructure or research institute around is our uh, GEMCAR. So, that is a, a platform for integrating uh, uh, electron microscopy into the synchrotron business and make it available for the normal user. So, we have one which is uh, for a cryo uh, TM which is for, uh, uh, for biological samples, for molecules. And the other one is here, uh, material science microscope. And this whole thing is now completed with another project, which is much larger, where you start to see a little bit the trend, right? Uh, and this is with similar partners, or the same partners, really, and here you do a whole microscopy platform for energy materials. So it's much more than doing only one experiment. And here is our vision, what we want to be in this five, ten years in future. So we want to have ALBA integrated in a whole infrastructure where you do all the kind of additional kind of research uh, and, and sample preparation and pre-characterization and computing. And you see there will be at the end four, hopefully four, institutes. One is ALBA II, so our upgraded facility. Oh, sorry. Uh, one is AMBIC, which is the Life Science Institute. And one will be COMTAC, which is the Material Science Institute. And here now you see there's a third one, a uh, fourth one, industry. And that is an inst industry uh, related institute which is focused to make the kind of resources what you get with the other three institutes here, what you make so the interface that industry can really use it. Okay? So that is how we think that uh, in future this whole business will be done and how innovation gets really created and how you bridge uh, basic and applied science. So here is a, a timeline. I don't want to go too much, but let's go really into specifics about science. So this is life science and innovation again, what is it? And you have all heard about CRISP uh, therapy. So you specifically tune individual genes, right, to switch something on and off. And so one of the problems is obviously you have to understand does it do really something or not? And does it do that what you want? And so here is an example where you measure a, a, a healthy cell with an infected cell 
And then you have the CRISP uh, therapy cell, and you compare the morphology of the cell to each other. And what you gain by that is that what is taking normally a very long evolution step in clinical trial, that can be now accelerated. So this is a big gain, especially if you have an illness which is not very common, because then it's very expensive. So here is the chance for uh, innovation. <clears throat> then another example here from, uh, from the battery field. So here is an interesting problem where you have an alloy, and it can, an alloy can be ordered or disordered. So if it's ordered, then you have in periodic system varying the one element with the other one. In that case, it is uh, nickel and manganese, okay? If it's ordered, it turns out that the material breaks much easier when you charge and discharge. If it's disordered, so not really periodically ordered, then it uh, sustains much more the charging and discharging. So, and what you do here with EXAFs, I guess one of the kind of experience what you will have also here at ALBA, is that you can measure with, so on one hand, the charge state, so you learn that there is nickel going through four, uh, three different stages, manganese to two different stages. But what is really the interesting thing is when you look on the de Bayer factor, a quantity which is uh, expressing the disorder, you see that the disorder so this curve here, you see, is much larger than that one, the amplitude. So this means in one case, you get a much more disorder of the oxygen cage than in the other one, which is at the end resulting in the crack and all the troubles what you have with stability. Here another kind of example, an example about how to build an organic transistor which has similar properties like that of a silicon. So obviously it's something very important and it was honored by getting an H out of that. And what you see is they used, here's one of the guys uh, who have done grazing incidents and measured really the kind of phase space and the parameters what you have to tune to get the right crystal structure to get exactly the conductivity what you need. So these are the kind of things I think what clearly shows you how the innovation can be pushed and how you can contribute. Here is another example in a slightly different way which goes more into something like spintronics, so computing. I don't know if you have realized that at the moment, if we do what we do, I think at currently we have about 10% of our energy requirement uh, with communication and computer center. If you look on the growth rate, it's exponential and 30, it can be at, as bad as about 60% of our energy goes in computing. So we have really to do something. And it's fundamental what you have to do. You cannot do incremental. And this is one of this kind of basic science, but which shows you where, where the next big step is. What they are doing here, they can show since the magnetism of a layer um, is directly linked to the steps in the substrate. So if you know that, you know how you build your next device much closer than you had before where you had no control about the domain wall. So here another example from life science, from the development of a, a drug uh, um, uh, for cancer. So it's a iridium uh, uh, drug, and the iridium is extremely toxic. So you want that it goes only into the cells, which are really the cancer cell and not the other one, because otherwise you have terrible side effects. And what they found here is that this has much less uh, side effects than normal iridium uh, drugs. And so the question was why? And what they could do here with correlative microscopy, which means you are using various kind of microscopies which get you different kind of information and put all the data sets together to one picture. And that's exactly what you see here in the bottom. Here are the different microscopy sites. 
And then you can really show that the iridium is only in the mitochondria and not anywhere else. And that's the trick because the mitochondria are very active in, in the cancer cell, so that's why this drug works like it does. Now, if you go to drug development a lot, if you think, for example, on vaccinations, and we have all learned much more than we wanted in the last few years about that. So, uh, traditionally, you do MX, you do high-resolution structures of the uh, proteins, and then you are thinking how they fit together. Now, there is really a revolution going on, and the revolution is the deep understanding. It's not only the structure, what you see statically, if you like, but it is really how is the, the morphology of this uh, molecule changing during the action. And so how you do that? Um, and one of the key points here is a new tool, which is data analytics, which gets you to a new program tool, which is at the moment alpha fault or any related kind of programs. And that one puts you the individual blocks together and makes prediction about how does this thing work in the real environment. And so we are at the moment trying to adjust to that and get, for example, high throughput throughput data on the fragments, and then you have some kind of tools which measure the envelope, and then you have the alpha fold, and you can now predict much better and test if it is, and you can combine it with the electron microscopy, so you get a much better picture. Okay, now back to material science. So you all know when you are going with your car that your car produces CO2. But unfortunately, it's not only the CO2 what you produce by blowing the gas out, but it's steel, which produces a lot of CO2. So during the re uh, reduction of the ore to the iron, you, this is one of these kind of processes where a lot of CO2 is created, so it's called blast furnace. You can also do something with hydrogen, but there is a whole bunch of own problems what you have to solve. And so here is an example, uh, this Fresme, where Sweden, so under the guidance from Spain, Sweden was making a, a test plant where you use the CO2 from, uh, from a blast furnace and produced maritime fuel and then really used it. And they were doing a whole cycle and understanding what kind of profits you can make. So also something which is very important, that's really innovation. And here is from uh, Krupp uh, uh, a kind of picture what they see in future about this kind of whole thing. So you integrate now totally different industries where you have the producer of the CO2 and the hydrogen from the regenerative table, and you go then on the other side here to all these kind of consumers, what you normally feed with oil. So now, but when you look in the different processes, you see that's all catalysis and very complex catalysis. Now, what is the problem of catalysis? Here you see it. So uh, when you go from uh, CO2 and hydrogen to methanol, you have the problem here, you see it you have the problem that you have many intermediates. And the intermediates, there has to be some kind of time scales which has to fit together, and the material has to change within this time. And here is a simulation which goes really through this process, and they make calculations how the environment of this uh, uh, carbon here from the CO2 has to change. There's many, many steps where, where defects have to move around. So a highly complex problem where you have uh, periodic and not periodic uh, uh, things all uh, together. Here's an example of steel. So something, again, what you would not think about that innovation is necessary. But if you go to a high-strength steel, it's titanium what is often used. Titanium is extremely rare and scarce, and you are depending on people who may not like to sell it to you. So, 
what you can do with iron. And it turns out that steel can be manufactured in a way that it's much stronger than you have with a normal steel, but it's microstructure. And working on understanding the microstructure, understanding how the microstructure is doing the reliability, that's what you can do on a synchrotron. Now, here is a different kind of experiments what you can do. I don't go here in the detail because I see already that Alejandro is looking on the watch. So, uh, now, something, something different, which is uh, something from my own past, what I personally find is really important. So, I'm a, I would say, so my, my background is magnetism, so something which is really as basic as it gets. Uh, but so at one point in my life, I learned that real world is much more complex than if I'm as a physicist sit in my corner and think about a nice experiment. And this here is the example of 3D printing. And this is a turbine plate, which is perhaps the most investigated turbine plate in the world. It's from GE printed. Uh, but you have to understand that no safety-related material is 3D printed at the present. And the reason is that the process is so non-linear that it's not producing you uh, enough reliability that you know when this uh, product is breaking. So the question is, how in the hell you find out uh, that you do QA, but helping to develop this process, something very different, right? And so in that case, what we were doing is we printed a, a bunch of these stack bones, and then we were doing powder diffraction of all, all the area where it can break, and then we were breaking it, and in the powder diffraction ring, if you look here, there's obviously the normal kind of uh, integrated data where you see all the phases, but if you look in the 2D picture, there's much more information in it. So there's, for example, the density by how much scattering intensity you have in total. There is something like the grain sizes, the grain distribution, strain, stress. There's all this kind of information inside the picture. So now you have thousands, hundreds of thousands of this data. And if you take all the pictures, it's enormous. So what you need to do is now to find correlations in data where you have not really a good clue what is the main determining factor. So you have to clean up your data and you use really big data live to solve a real problem where you don't know what is the underlying problem. And I think that's one of the new things if you speak about innovation, what we have to learn. And so I think there is, yes. The big thing when, when we are zooming in in Alba, which is obviously the center of the world, and you see then this future where we hope that we can enable all that and give you as a user or you come to us and provide that to a user, really this kind of tool that, which is much more than a single experiment, but the expertise to really produce the innovation. So a multiband acromant is um, when you, uh, a synchrotron is not a ring, but it's a polygon, and you have normal dipole uh, magnets, and you are moving with each magnet n degrees, say, electron beam. If you move the electron beam a large radius, then you emit a lot of photons, but with the price that your electrons are getting different kind of trajectory through, through your machine. And that makes the emittance of the electron beam large. And that makes the source size for your experiment large. So if you want to overcome that problem, what you do is you split a, 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 a bending, which is relative large, in multiple small ones. And by that trick, what you do is you lose less energy every time when you go around, and that makes the ring 
uh, with a much lower emittance, and that makes the ability to make source sizes, which are much smaller, and that is benefiting a few different things. So number one is microscopy. Number two, it is the energy range at a given energy of a ring. You can only reach so many high energetic photons. And what this kind of better electron beam gives you is pushing this to the upper limit. And then the other kind of thing is obviously you have to combine with what I showed here, uh, the whole thing, the whole complex about sample environments, the, the kind of data analytics, all that has to be combined. So this is the, what is called now fourth generation synchrotron. So we are on the path to that, and I showed at one point a timeline, and this will happen most likely 2030. So we both are close to retirement, so we can compete with you. Uh, um, so, but maybe also a little bit earlier. Uh, so now an FEL is a, so soft X-rays will be always an important thing. In soft X-rays you gain in to higher energies a higher amount of coherence. And what does coherence buy you? is in principle the ability uh, to do new kind of spectroscopies where you get the uh, structure and especially in magnetism area that is really something very useful because there it's very difficult to do the magnetic structure with a TM. So we are following this kind of route on the FEL side we are not really doing anything on the FEL, and frankly speaking, so FEL is an instrument where you have a LINAC, and then you have, in principle, one instrument at the end. On the synchrotron, you have one LINAC, then you have the ring, and I loved your, your comment about synchrotron and uh, storage ring, because I was fighting this fight here. Um, and, but the problem is, on a storage ring, you have something like 10, 20 instruments. On a FAL, you may have two or three, but not more. So the cost per experiment is much, much higher. And frankly speaking, that is, I think, the reason why it is not very likely that we will do that. My dream would be, however, uh, and I think Katerina would uh, fall here out of the shoes if I say that here publicly. But my dream would be in the long beam lines, what you have seen, what we will build, to integrate a terahertz laser and use the terahertz laser for pump experiments and then doing movies. The old uh, story about molecular movies. <laughs> 